In this podcast, we want to dive into the paradoxes and complexities of the Catholic faith. Jesus is the Lion of Judah and the Lamb of God. He's the same Messiah who drives money changers out of the temple and calls us to himself so we can find rest and peace. The gospel he gives us is beautiful and simple and at the same time challenging and complicated. So join us as we look at the Lion and the Lamb, the simple and the complex, and try to bring our complicated world into the peace and beauty of the Catholic faith. Hey, welcome to Roar Like the Lamb, Father Sam Kachuba. And I'm Paula Pena, and we are back. We're back. How you doing? I'm doing great. Yeah? I am. Okay. Feeling very alive with the spirit. Yeah. Although, like um, here's my one thing for this week. Are you prepared? For the one thing? Yeah. Well, are you sure it's, it's going to be one? Well, this is for one thing that's been really sticking <laughs> right. out. Lay it I on burned me. my mouth eating drunken noodles. It's a Thai place called <laughs> Ru Thai, and I ordered it medium. I had curry from this place like a couple months before, and I was like, yeah, I can handle medium. So then I had it. I haven't been able to eat anything spicy because anything spicy that I would say, oh, that's fine. It doesn't hurt. Now actually hurts. So I legit. Did you, did you burn your mouth or did the spice affect the, your mouth in such a way? that I think the spice you? burned off a, la- a layer of like my skin. <laughs> it. I can't like the other day I went to go have. Oh, we went to sushi. Even like the sodium in the, in the soy sauce was killing me. And I was like, what the heck? I know. I just what I'm saying. And then I went to go have a spicy chicken sandwich another day this week. Love it from Popeye's. Couldn't have it because it legit burned my mouth. Huh. Yeah. So well, this place, you know, Rue Thai, it's phenomenal. I, <laughs> I just, it burned my mouth <laughs> and it's still healing. Well, let's say you burned your mouth. Okay, that's Let's fine. not blame them. Well. Like, I think it's your fault. You the thing is, I ordered the same spice level that I did before, and this time it just came a lot harder. You ate it too fast? No, I took one bite, and I had to have two glasses of milk just to get through half of the meal. That was phenomenal. No, it was terrible. Don't take those kinds of risks. <laughs> so, yeah, okay. that, that's what happened to me, and I'm still recovering. All right. Well, I yesterday found a package at the door um, from Land's End, and I was confused by this package from Land's End because I've – Never in my adult life ordered anything from Land's End. You tell me that boys don't, I mean, men don't shop at Land's End. I am an adult male and I have never had occasion to purchase anything from Land's End. When I was a kid, my mom used to buy stuff for us from Land's End all the time, like school clothes and things like that. That was, that was no problem, but I have never, I've never actually bought anything. So I was very surprised. It was a gift from yeah. Krishner sending me, sending me some stuff. You know, it'd be really great is if more parishioners now know like, oh wow, we can just buy him stuff from Land's End and then you'll just have packages <laughs> and packages of all packages. Well, shout out to Dawn, uh, for the very kind gift from, from her and her family. Um, it was very unexpected. So I was kind of confused <laughs> getting this stuff. He thought it was a mistake. <laughs> yeah. But then I started thinking, all right, have you ever seen the movie Best in Show? No, I haven't. So Best in Show is a mockumentary. It's a Christopher Guest mockumentary. It's one of my one of my all-time favorite movies. Mm-hmm. Um, it's about a dog show and and oh. the people who are showing their their dogs and trying to get prizes and stuff. Anyway, so <laughs> one of the one of the characters of this couple, um, they talk about how they spend most of their life doing catalog shopping. This is the movie was made a little, a little while yes, ago. Yes, it was. It very... Before everything was on Amazon and stuff like that. So yeah. they're talking about how they, they get most of their clothes through catalogs because that way they don't have to talk to people. <laughs> <laughs> and it's it's kind of brilliant. And and I love it. You know, I know people like that nowadays. So <laughs> that's how they like to move through that's life. Why, that's why I use mostly Amazon stuff because <laughs> I don't have to talk to people. It's great. Oh, that's man. Fantastic. Well, yeah, because you don't want to talk to people in case you get rejected. <laughs> <laughs> that is a, a terrible oh, transition man. to what we're talking about you're like, today. You're trying to set it up too much. <laughs> oh, it's so corny. <laughs> That's totally mean. I thought it was really funny. That was good. That was good. It was I'm, really I'm dumb. But dumb works. Never forget that. Dumb works that. for me, though. It works. That's it what works I'm trying so to say. Well, never forget that. Okay. Uh, yeah. I want to talk today about um, about missionary rejection. The idea that if we're if we're supposed to be on mission sharing the faith, that there are going to be times when when we get rejected, and th- this comes kind of from, I would say like two full weeks of just feeling really beat up. Mm. Um, this last week has been a lot better. I'm not gonna lie, That's good. <laughs> this last week has been a lot better. But I feel like I went through maybe just two weeks of feeling really beat up about everything, like not a single thing that was being done uh, seemed to be hitting its mark. Um, 
it felt like a lot of a lot of people second guessing every decision or just complaining about everything that was going on, no matter how much we were trying. Mm. And now part of that is is pandemic life. Everybody's just really stressed and mm-hmm. stretched. So there are things that ordinarily nobody would bat an eye at, but now it just it pushes a button and it pushes a button the wrong way. Mm-hmm. Um, Anyway, it was just like two weeks of feeling really, really beat up uh, and also feeling not just beat up, but like like the mission itself to share the gospel was just being pushed away. Mm. And I got to thinking a lot about for a diocesan priest, we are trained to keep a parish going mm-hmm. and to give life to a parish and to lead a parish. And that's a, a certain type of mission and it's a certain type of evangelization but it's a little bit more of a, a settled population. You know, so you've got your, your parish community. It's the people who live in this geographical area. Mm-hmm. It's the people who come to mass at this particular church. It's the people who by their own choice have said, I, I wanna be there. Typically your, your diocesan priest is, is not going out. Uh, it's not a missionary kind of mm-hmm. setting in the way that we normally think of the missionary. So the other day we had the, the Feast of St. Francis Xavier. Mm-hmm. And the reading for the Feast of St. Francis Xavier is a letter that he wrote to St. Ignatius of Loyola. And he talks about getting to India and how there were very few Christians and those who were there had nobody to instruct them. So all they knew was that at some point they had been baptized. The faith had been passed on generationally, but they didn't have priests. So they didn't know any of their prayers. They didn't know anything. They just knew that they were Christians. Mm. And so the desire that the people had was to be baptized for those who weren't baptized yet. It was to learn prayers. And he talks about how the children wouldn't give him even a moment alone. He had to teach them stuff. They just insisted. They wanted so badly to learn this stuff. And then he would go out and he'd be evangelizing and teaching other people and bringing more people in and how many he was he was converting it's this brilliant brilliant sign of of what happens when you're faithful to the mission but for uh, your typical parish priest that's not what we're doing mm-hmm. right so i was thinking about this as a focus missionary because Former you, focus you were missionary. a focus missionary when you did all your training and everything did they talk to you about the rejection that you'll face in the mission yeah they give you an inspiration of quote, eternity is worth the awkwardness. I love it. So <laughs> embrace the awkward. Yes. Yeah, it literally was. So it's, what do they tell you to do with with rejection? What do they like how do they tell you to pray through that, to process it, to to deal with it? The fact that some people just don't want to hear what you have to say. I mean, I'll give you an example of somebody who didn't want to hear what I had to say. <laughs> this is my first year as a missionary. By the end of the first semester, we had to give gospel presentations. So essentially, um, for every student that we had encountered, um, we had been building a one-on-one relationship with each of them, um, getting to know them. And there was a point where you would come and say, hey, like, do you have some time to chat? And you were gonna present to them Jesus. And then you were gonna offer, you're gonna present to them this question, do you want a relationship with God? Like, you know, gotta, like, do you wanna accept Jesus? Because I think, you know, that's the really turning point for for a lot of people in faith is, it's not until they make that personal proclamation themselves do then do they get to live in that. So I was sharing the story of the gospel of Jesus saving, you know, all of us and and really just offering um, this cadet this um, this option who was silent for about a minute. She got up and walked out the door. And I was like, "Oh my goodness, what did I do?" <laughs> she listened. She listened. Well, she Oh, well, no, well, I should say like she listened, she broke down crying, got up and walked out and I didn't hear from her for about two months. Okay. You know, we went over to winter break, we came back and it was just so hard because at that point it's just like, you, you know enough that we have to be intense for Jesus. Um, and I've been reflecting this past week. Uh, so we just, it's the second week of Advent. Um, and just looking at the first part in Isaiah where he says like, go out and cry out as loud as you can. Like, do you, do I do that? Do I proclaim? And then you have this image of John the Baptist, this crazy man on fire for Jesus, doesn't care. Um, And so you're just so, you're so unashamed and you're so intense for the gospel that you know the urgency that it is. Um, I, there's, I think there's a delicate balance between proclaiming the gospel and like being an annoying person on a soapbox on the corner telling everybody you're going to hell, which is not what you're supposed to do. But then there's other like, hey, within the context of a friendship that I have with you, let me tell you about this guy that I know. Um, 
this guy. It's this guy. This, this guy. This guy. You know, you know it's kind of Lord. the Lord. Um, has been around for a while, but can I can I share with you yeah. about him, and then can I invite you into a relationship with him? Really making that point um, definitive in their life. Um, but even just as I prayed with the scriptures this week, I was like, Jesus, make me on fire. I I want to be like John the Baptist. I I I want to be crazy for you, because. I don't want to be lukewarm. Like I think when you're when you're lukewarm, I mean you're not really sharing the gospel. You're just like going through the motions. You're not really living this adventure that God has called you into. Um, but with rejection, it's going to happen. Like all the saints were rejected. Like sure. people were rejected. But it, you know, I think at the end of the day, it doesn't have anything to do. Don't not to take it so personally, but it's, am I being faithful to Jesus? Because right. Jesus is asking me to do this. Am I allowing myself to be stretched in the ways that Jesus wants me to be stretched? And I remember a priest saying, like, you know, you as a missionary, you're a punching bag for Jesus. Can you take on this rejection and unite yourself to him on the cross? Can you take this rejection and in a way comfort him? Mm. Because you are sharing in his passion in this way. And you are comforting Jesus on the cross that you are not separate from it but you're with him. And in a way you've actually grown in deeper intimacy with Jesus because now you, in a way you're privileged to enter into a part of um, his passion that one strengthens you as a missionary, but two, you get to know the heart that longs for you. Hmm. Um, so yeah, you can turn it into like, Oh, me, 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 me. But the me is it's, it's, it has to be pointed back to Jesus on the cross um, see, one of the things that I was thinking about for a, for example, a focused missionary or even even a missionary to a, a foreign country, to a, a place where nobody has ever heard the gospel before, if the people that they're going to speak the gospel to or the people that they're trying to introduce Jesus to, if they reject it, the missionary is going to keep trying. Mm -hmm. You have the, you have the chance to keep to keep going. And I don't know if this is a, a false difference that I'm inventing in my head or if this is a, a very real thing. But if I look at a parish community, especially for a diocesan priest, the way that diocesan priests are trained, the way that we're prepared for, for ministry, there's sort of a presumption that the parish community is already there. Mm. And then if, and I think this might be one of the reasons that diocesan priests can struggle with evangelization and with the, the sense of mission and why sometimes parish life feels like it's not going anywhere. Um, sometimes parishes can feel like they're, they're just sort of stuck. And, and the, the critique that you'll often hear, especially when you're, you're like reading a lot of these, uh, these different books about creating vibrant parishes, they'll talk about how it's not a dynamic parish that, that goes out to evangelize. And I always think the reason that it's not a dynamic parish to go out to evangelize, if a parish isn't dynamic and going out to evangelize, it's because at home they're not they're mm. not dynamic and evangelized. It's not because they, they're unwilling to go out. It's that they, they themselves haven't had that evangelization, right? So a missionary on a college campus or in a, a particular population that has never heard the gospel can go and preach the gospel. And you can go and be that that voice and that loud, crazy person. <laughs> who's just sharing the gospel. And then by the way that you live, you can do this. St. Charles uh, Foucault, mm. or blessed Charles Foucault, mm -hmm. uh, he had almost no converts from his time in the desert, but he was well-respected. He was well-known. But he lived this very solitary life of prayer and giving witness. And the people knew his witness, but almost no one converted because of him. And yet he just stayed faithful to it. But in part, it was because he was also a monastic. He was a monastic living this mission in this in an unevangelized place. Go to a parish, though, and the presumption is that all the people who are there are evangelized. Mm. Or at the very least, they they have some they have some degree of faith. <clears throat> and so, when a if somebody rejects what the what the pastor is trying to give to them or what what the priest is offering, so in other words, if there's rejection on the part of of parishioners, the people who are part of the community already in the church, like I'm not trying to convince them to to come to the church. I'm not trying to convince them even of the sacramental life. They're already there. Right, <laughs> they already get it, but if they start to reject that, then the fear is that they leave. Mm. And I think a lot of diocesan priests, myself included, I'm not like this isn't a critique of other people out there. This is this is a personal critique that they'll they'll worry that they're going to lose people, and so pull back on the evangelization, pull back on speaking certain things because they don't want their their parish community to start to disappear. 
But in a way, then you also water down the exactly. faith, and that's exactly. what we're in right now. Yeah, and that's where it gets really difficult. Mm-hmm. So the thing that I've been thinking about, this came up, uh, I think, before I was ready to really start thinking through this, but we, we passed back in November the feast of Andrew Kim Taigon and his companions, the Martyrs of Korea. And over the course of, I think it was 150 years or something, maybe longer than that, um, I can't remember now. Anyway, over the course of more than a century, there were all these martyrs in Korea and many of them were native born Koreans, but many were from other countries who had come as missionaries. And I started to realize that almost every place where you see missionaries going and preaching the gospel, you also see within a generation, if not those very ones who first went to that place preaching the gospel, within a generation, as soon as there is a Christian community there, you will see persecution and you will see martyrdom. You will see people who are, are, are killed for the sake of the Catholic faith and because of what they're doing as missionaries. Now, sometimes that happens, again, to the missionaries who come right away. Sometimes it happens to those who, who they convert. But you always see martyrs. Mm-hmm. And that got me thinking, I think that a a necessary component of all missionary activity in the life of the church is martyrdom. I'm totally, yeah. It's this, martyrdom. This literally reminds me of a, of a talk in Focus where, but, but then, white, white martyrdom. Right. It's not, it's, it's not, not red martyrdom that you're where going you're spilling to be killed. your blood. Exactly. Yeah. We might never die for our faith, but martyrdom yeah. is going to happen. There's going to be some kind of rejection. That's where I started thinking about this idea of like missionary rejection as the beginnings of, of martyrdom. Mm-hmm. And the only way that you get, you can deal with that missionary rejection is if you adopt a spirit of, of martyrdom. Not like I'm just telling myself that everybody who disagrees with me is therefore trying to martyr me. <laughs> <laughs> because sometimes I'm wrong and people are gonna disagree with me and it's because I'm wrong. It's not because they're, they're rejecting anything that I'm doing. Yeah. But there are many times when in fact, it's, it's a wound that I'm, I'm receiving and I've gotta be ready to absorb that and bring it to the Lord in prayer. I've gotta be ready to, to accept that martyrdom, even though it's bloodless. Yeah. I've gotta be ready to, to recognize that sometimes the, the good news of the faith is, is gonna be rejected. Sometimes the truth of what it is that we believe and how we are supposed to live our Catholic faith, sometimes that's gonna be rejected by people. And I have to, I have to come to a, a level of, of acceptance without making it, like you said before, making it personal. Mm -hmm. And at the same time, without ever losing heart in going out and speaking the truth of the gospel again. I I was thinking about this yesterday. Well, I think about a lot of this, a lot of this stuff, but do I really believe in what the Catholic church says? And do I really believe that it is true? That everything that she preaches, everything that she teaches, because if I know it to be true, that I'm going to be willing to enter into this, um, this tuffle or this, you know, conversation with culture, um, really trying to be like swim upstream, like a salmon, like really truly swim upstream because I know that it's worth it because I know that it's true. But if I'm not convicted that it is true, if I'm still kind of on like this teetering thing and I'm still trying to assimilate, you know, what the church says with what the culture says and trying to find a happy ground, um, then that's, you know, it's the breeding ground for lukewarmness and not really, um, experiencing like not not just this this freedom but just this radical availability to truly transform and reform the church Mm. because the church is in crisis because i don't know how many people know that what the church teaches and that what she is is actually it's she's true and I, i was thinking like okay like i'm so aware of like other denominations and like oh you know that seems a little bit easier that seems more fun. That seems nicer, you know, and, and not going to lie. Like it hits me. I, it, it, I think about it sometimes. But I'm like, no, nah, man, like I encountered the truth of the Catholic church at 18. Like I can never leave it. I know what it is. Jesus is in the Eucharist, like apostolic succession, all of that stuff. It's, it's real. Why are we screaming that from the rooftops? Why are we proclaiming that? And it was a check with myself. Paula, are you doing enough to proclaim this? Are you doing enough to to preach it and to talk about it, um, to show? Because that's what you love more. Um, Paul, Paul, Pope Paul VI says um, people listen to teachers, people listen listen to witnesses more than teachers. It's not enough to simply teach the faith; you have to witness it, and people who are witnessing have to be surrendered, convicted, committed 
Catholics. Mm. Because those are the ones you're like, whoa, there's something about you that I haven't seen before. Or when someone talks about a Catholic, oh, you're just not, oh, you're one of those people that aren't just happy and you don't really know God, but it's a cultural thing. Yeah. You know, and it's so sad, but that's literally the image of Catholicism for a lot of people. Oh, yeah, I grew up Catholic or, you know, use it as a joke. Um, oh, yeah, like, I, you know, I went to Catholic school and all those things. But how many people who went to Catholic school actually know Jesus? Right. You know, how many right. people in Catholic school actually really know their faith in such a way that it's like. That's one of the things that pains me um, it's slightly off. But I talk to people and they, 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 they'll tell me about how they made sure to send their kids to Catholic school. They sent their kids to a Catholic college. And even after all of that, their kids no longer practice the faith. And they, they feel so badly about that because they thought that they were doing the right thing by sending their kids to Catholic <clears> school. And I, I think sometimes that's just a generational difference. Mm -hmm. when you went to Catholic school and to a Catholic college at the time, back when you did that, that was number one, the thing to do. Number two, you were given a really solid background in the Catholic faith. Whereas by the time your kids came along, the schools had changed so much. The way of teaching the faith had changed so much that it, it wasn't, it very simply wasn't as solid. We've had a, a crisis of the way that we catechize, the way that we teach, the way that we lead people to an encounter with Christ, mm -hmm. because we haven't been in encouraging them to the encounter with Christ. We've been encouraging them to the encounter with other people, mm -hmm. which is very good. Don't get me wrong. It's, right. it's awesome to be in, in communion with other people. But if that's not something that is rooted in a personal relationship with Christ, if that's not something that's rooted in a communal relationship with Christ, mm -hmm. then yeah, it's very nice to be in this group of people, but I don't need the church for that group of people. I can find that group of people anywhere. Exactly. And yeah, so we've, we've definitely, I think, struggled to, to do those things and to do them well. But where missionary rejection was hitting me hard was I was finding myself getting frustrated with people who no matter what I tried to offer them, and no matter how many different ways I tried to explain something to them, still just didn't want it. You offer options to people. Here are, here are five options for what we can do. And here's how we can accommodate you. Here's how we can do something for you. And to then have them throw it back and say, you just don't understand. You just don't care. You're just not compassionate. You're just not willing to, to listen. Mm. Anyways, I've, I've responded to or respond, tried to respond as well as I could to every single thing that you've, that you've offered me. Now there could be a question about whether or not the response is, is the right thing or if I just need to listen, but you've asked this question and, and I've offered you this, this answer. I've tried to help you problem solve, but it's pretty clear you don't want the problem solved. You want what you want. And then I started feeling like, all right, if I feel like I'm being rejected and the things that I'm offering them aren't good enough for them, well, then I'm done. I'm just going to shake the dust from my feet and move on to the next town because Jesus tells me to do that. Jesus tells me it's okay to shake the dust from my feet and move on. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, do I have enough missionary zeal to care for that person, to care for that family, to care for that particular situation that I won't give up, mm -hmm. that I'll keep bringing them to the Lord in prayer, that I'll place them on the altar every day? Yeah that I'll leave them in the tabernacle with Jesus spiritually. Do I have enough missionary zeal that I want them to understand what the church, what the parish is doing because I want them to be able to receive the gospel and not just receive the gospel, but I want them to know Jesus Christ alive in their life. Yeah. If I have enough missionary zeal, then I'm going to be on my knees every day praying for them. Mm -hmm. And then I realize how little missionary zeal I have because I'm just complaining about how annoying they are. <laughs> or I'm upset because I feel rejected on a personal level. And it's of course, it's not about me, but yeah. it's always about me. Oh, it's always my. about me. <laughs> it should never be about me, but it's so easy to fall into that. What is the story of the, the Bible passage? Um, what must I do to gain eternal life? And Jesus says, you know, you have to do this and this, you know, get rid of this. But then the young man doesn't do that and he walks away unhappy. What does it mean though when, so Jesus ends that, yeah. go sell what you have, give to the poor, mm -hmm. come follow me. Yeah. At the end of the day, it says that the, the young man has, has many possessions. That's why he went away sad. Yeah. But I think that, that in that passage, he went away sad because he had many possessions. That was the thing that was going to prevent him from following Jesus. But that was the thing ultimately that he could use as his excuse for not following Jesus. Mm -hmm. I have many possessions. It was really that he didn't want Jesus. 
He wanted what he wanted. He wanted to hear that he was good, that he was doing all the right things. He didn't want to hear that he had to do something additional, in particular that he had to follow Jesus. Mm -hmm. To give up the possessions and everything, I think he could have gotten. To, I, this is me now speculating wildly on a story that <laughs> does not have any further detail in the gospel. So forgive me for that kind of exegesis or eisegesis or whatever it's yeah. supposed to be called. But I think it's exegesis, maybe. The, the idea that go sell what you have and follow me. I think he could have gotten to the point of saying, yeah, I, I believe that I need to give to the poor. But if I have to follow you, that means I can't get any of that stuff back. That means I can't hang on to any of anything at all. I have to go with you completely. Yeah. And that means not only do I have to go with you, I have to, I have to really start listening to all the things that you're teaching. I have to live by every single one of those things that you're teaching. I have to conform myself to yeah. it. I have and, to conform myself to truth. And to conform yeah. means to give up my own so, preferences and, and my own previous desires. Mm -hmm. The other thing yeah. with this too, though, and we don't talk about this, this is also a spiritual battle. This is why this is also really difficult to take, you know, if somebody's rejecting you, you think they're rejecting you. Um, and not just Jesus, but, you know, at the same time, can't forget that the enemy is working his way in causing division and isolation and confusion. It's a very, very real thing. Yeah. Uh, and if we get into a place of, oh, this happened to me on Saturday. I was journaling about something and I was listening to a podcast and then I was complaining to God about something. And I was like, well, why don't you do that for me? Here I am. So I'm in this space of just, you know, walking around in my head and in my heart complaining to God, well, why can't you just do this? Why can't you just do that? In the meantime, I should have just sat down and prayed. But what I did was for a while is I sat in a place of complaining. Then I finally sat my butt down and I started journaling. And right as I'm starting, this moment of grace comes in. And I realize, wow, this is where the devil is tricking me. He has me so confused with this frustration that I have with God that's based out of a good desire but has me confusing this desire with frustration and this frustration can only be blamed on God himself. Mm. And if I can complain to God about it and I'm just running in circles, then I'm not there to actually receive what God wants me to have in prayer. In other words, the devil's going to do everything in, he, in his power to prevent me from prayer, to prevent me from being in a place to receive. Um, and I just had this image of the father wanting to pour certain graces into me. And there was this image of me, like, you know, he's got like, let's imagine he's got like a bucket of water and he's trying to pour it into me, but I'm too busy running around and I won't sit still. I won't sit still. And I was like, dang it. And I was so grateful because it was such a place of recognizing that if, if I'm frustrated, it's not, it's not with, it isn't towards the Lord, but it's, um, the enemy is confusing or making me believe that this frustration is based out of an empty promise um, that God doesn't want to fulfill and he's going to distract me by that. But here, I think what's just so cunning about that's why he's cunning is that the devil is so subtle mm. about how he causes division, um, how he causes isolation, how he causes despair. It doesn't have to be so and so big and so noticeable because he doesn't want to be so noticeable. It wants to be subtle. And so um, with being rejected in terms of like, you know, being a missionary and, and, and doing all of those things, um, recognize at the same time that there's also a spiritual battle at play, um, that I'm entering into battle. And if I'm in a place of complaining, I need to get out of that place because that's God is not in the complaining. I mean, God's going to be there to receive it, but I can't stay there because it's not good for me and it's also not good for the people I'm called to pray for. Mm. Well, the complaining can, can be that giving of your wounds over to the Lord. Right. Being it's, honest. It's letting God know this is what, yeah. this is what's on my heart. And by recognizing those things, God knows our hearts, mm -hmm. right? God knows what we want before we ask it. We don't, theoretically, we don't even need to, to ask. It's that when we do, we are identifying, Lord, I'm, I'm open to receiving from you what you want to give me. Mm -hmm. So Lord, here's my problem. Here's here's my heart. Here's my wound. Here's the the struggle that I'm in right now. I know you already know it. 
I don't have to tell you that mm-hmm. <laughs> you are well aware of, of my struggles. But here's the thing that that I am hanging on to by by speaking about it, by complaining about it. Even I'm opening myself up to you correcting me mm-hmm. and to you being present in that. So what happens when we follow Jesus? Go sell what you have, give to the poor, then come follow me. Where does that lead? Mm. Where does Jesus go? He goes to the cross. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. Like how many times in the gospel? Oh, I said yes to suffering. <laughs> how yes. many times in the gospel do you hear Jesus? It, it says something like Jesus turned toward Jerusalem. Jer- Jesus set his face to journey toward Jerusalem. It's this this turning towards going to the cross, going to Calvary. I have to go up to God's holy city. I have to go to the place of sacrifice mm-hmm. because it's at, in the temple of Jerusalem that all of the sacrifices were offered. And those sacrifices were offered in expiation for sin, in prayer for certain blessings, in thanksgiving for different things. So all of the sacrifices and all the different meanings behind each of the different sacrifices were all offered in Jerusalem. So Jesus now has to set his face towards Jerusalem so that he can go and offer that perfect sacrifice. So to follow Jesus means to go to the place of sacrifice. And it's the place of sacrifice that's not only in reparation, the mm-hmm. sacrifice for sin, it's the the pleading with God for healing. It's the the thanksgiving to God for every good gift and blessing that he gives. Jesus has to go up to that place of sacrifice. He becomes then the perfect sacrifice, mm-hmm. the full sacrifice. Everything is summed up in his sacrifice. So when Jesus on the cross is in his suffering, it's for all the different things that people do. It's for the sins that they commit. So it's the it's a, an atonement sacrifice. Yeah. But it's also for all those ways in which people fail in gratitude. Mm-hmm. It's for all the ways in which people fail to recognize their need for God. Jesus offers that all. So then if we're going to follow him, go sell what you have, give to the poor, then come follow me. That means we've got to be ready to go to the cross. So going to the cross means we're going to suffer. Every missionary then who has to go out and, and preach the gospel and share the good news this means they have to be ready also for some kind of suffering. There's going to be that every missionary ultimately has to be ready to accept some form of martyrdom. You know what I love, though, is when you hear these stories of saints going out to their martyrdom, how much joy yeah. they were in. I love it. I'm like, you were you were joyful as you, as you died because you were in a place of praise. Like, yes, I it's it's so it's awesome it literally is so awesome to have two different things coexist at the same time suffering and joy um and it and like we should desire we should truly desire that and if we don't desire it yet like you know pray for the desire to desire yeah well and, and desiring suffering is desiring desiring martyrdom it's not because like i want to die right right it's because i want to give witness yeah, I, I want to witness to the faith. My love for Jesus urges me on to to give witness in in this way. So it's funny because the martyrdom thing has come up with in conversation with a few different people, oh. including people who I would not expect to be talking about martyrdom. I was talking with this guy, and he said, "I don't know why, Father, but I've been I've been praying, and I keep having this image of of martyrdom, like." I have to be ready to die for for the sake of, of my faith. Like I have to be ready to to give Jesus everything, even even my life. And I was blown away by it because he's never talked about anything like that before with me, this guy. But mm-hmm. he's bringing it up that I just feel like this is something that that's going to happen or that I, I have to be at least ready for. And then in conversation with some other people, you look at the state of the world that we're in right now. And it's uh, am I ready to am I ready to suffer? I'm not ready to have some consequences because of my faith. Um, have you ever seen this comedian? Oh, it's it's brutal. No, you see more uh, comedians than I do. Uh, so. That's true. That's true. <laughs> he's, he's an Irish comedian, and he's got this whole this whole routine about uh, going to mass with a, in his case, an Australian priest versus an African priest, and he uses a lot of profanity, and it's it's pretty vulgar, but it's really really funny. Uh, <laughs> anyway, maybe Actually, I shouldn't be encouraging this. I don't know. I but think you sent me this. I've probably sent it to you before. <laughs> <laughs> he talks about he, the, the greatest line that he has in this whole routine is you want your priest to look like someone who's the, the decisions he's made in his life has, have had some consequences on his face. 
<laughs> it's just, you don't want your priest to look like a bank manager. You want your priest to look like John the Baptist. <laughs> you want him to look like he's just a wild looking man. Who's like, it's, it's hysterical, but there, there's some truth to that. Like our faith and what we believe about the power of the cross, what we believe about the gospel, it has to have a consequence in our life. And so Tertullian said this in the early church, mm. that the blood of martyrs is the seed of faith. If that's true, then we might not have to spill our blood for the sake of the gospel, but what is what is it that will give people the impetus to go and seek out the Lord? What is yeah. it that makes them think, hey, there, there's something there? It's If you're a credible witness, like St. Paul VI says, right? People listen to witnesses more than to mm. teachers. If there's something about the way that we're living that says this is this is true, this is worth living, this is worth following, then it, it does attract people. There are still going to be people who aren't interested yeah, because they're not looking for a witness. They're looking for what they want. Yeah. And if you're not giving them what they want, then they're going to they're going to move on. Yeah. In oh. in those places of, I guess, in a way, death to self in order to proclaim your faith, they're going to come in a lot of for a lot of us, it's in ordinary spaces. It's in our family. It's in our workplace. Um, it's in a, you know, a moment where I could just be a bystander in a situation like that's when it's really going to happen. Um, we're not that part of the church right now that exists in other parts of the world that is truly being persecuted for their faith and asked to renounce Jesus. Right. Act. But I don't think we're far from that. Well, I don't want to like be sound so, like, well, we're not, we're not separate anything. from them. Right. I don't, yeah. but I, I don't want to sound alarmist, but like we are rapidly in our culture right now here in this country, I think moving to a place where you can't even say God or Jesus religion is yeah. being marginalized. And that's yeah. not like, that's not like war on Christmas stuff. It's, no, we are, we really it. and truly are, are moving towards a place where religious faith is looked upon as a liability, mm -hmm. where any kind of religious practice is going to be looked at as strange yeah. or somehow antithetical to the American spirit. And that's a scary thought. But this is where, again, martyrdom mm -hmm. comes up. Yeah. We have to be ready to suffer for the sake of our faith. And we have to be ready that there may be things that are, are imposed from the outside. But when we suffer that and when we endure it, we, can, we have a chance to give witness. Yeah. We have a chance to really say, no, in fact, Christ is the one who's going to have the victory for me and in me and through me. And I may lose my, my own freedom. I may be limited in what I'm allowed to do. I may be prevented from going to certain places or doing certain things. Yeah. But I'm going to persevere in this. Like, I keep thinking back of like the, the persecutions of the church in Mexico. During mm -hmm. like the, the era of the Cristero War, uh, Blessed Miguel Pro. Yeah. And the, the power behind everything that they did at the time, priests, I mean, and this, this law actually existed for decades after the Cristero War ended. Uh, priests were not allowed to wear clerical attire. The, uh. the story that I heard, and, and I'd have to go and look and see, but this all seems really very, very true. When Pope St. John Paul II made his first pastoral visit to Mexico, I think in 1979, I think mm -hmm. it was his first international trip, if I'm not mistaken, was to Mexico. Mm -hmm. They had this little constitutional crisis in Mexico because it was illegal for a priest to appear in clerical attire. Oh, and they knew that John Paul II was going to show up yep. wearing his papal yep. cassock and that he was going to be in clerical attire. And there was a fine to be levied against any priest seen in public wearing his clerical attire. And this is, what do we do when the Pope comes? And I think the president of Mexico said, just give me the fine, I'll, I'll pay it. <laughs> ah. <laughs> and, but it wasn't long after that, that that law disappeared. Yeah. But, but he think, had, of, think he, of that, there, there was a period of time when for, for decades, priests were not allowed in public to wear the garb proper to their state of life. And yet, and yet the faith stayed alive. Yeah. And yet the Catholic Church remained, the, the Catholics in Mexico remained strong and faithful. Um, there was another one that was illegal to have processions. But every year people would pr do a giant procession to the Basilica of Our Lady of Guadalupe. I, I, I remember talking to a guy who had uh, had been to one of these processions and he said he, he, was, he was not Mexican himself. And he asked somebody, isn't this illegal? Isn't this something prohibited by by the law here? And they looked and they said, well, yeah, but 
this is for the Blessed Virgin Mary. It's okay. <laughs> this is for a lady of Guadalupe. And sure enough, it was like everybody would turn a blind eye to that. And I, I loved it. But there was something about that. They were willing to give witness. They were willing to do it. And even though there were limitations, even though there there was this attitude from a certain population that yeah. was going to kind of be be oppressive, there was still this willingness to, to give witness. And yeah. I think that's where we have to go. Even though sometimes people will reject the gospel. And, and even if they have the ability for certain limitations on us, we have to be ready to give witness anyway, that yeah. this is worth it. I, I'll deal with all of that stuff. And if it means that we have to suffer something, if it means we have to suffer uh, financially, if it means we have to suffer physically, if it means that we have to suffer something, I'll take that stuff. There is, uh, I was reading the chapter in John Paul II, and it talked about all the ways in which he, in a way, like was living white martyrdom as he went to all these different countries, you know. Um, and the two that stick out was when he, one when he went to Nicaragua, the other one he went to Chile. In Chile, he was baptizing a baby, and there were political protesters outside the church just chanting, 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 and like trying to stop the baptism from happening, he was like, forget about it. I'm gonna keep doing this. And then in Nicaragua, he was speaking out against the liberation theology that had really taken over um, the country and had affected priests. Um, and they were, he was just calling them out. He was just like, this is not the gospel. This is not true freedom. True freedom is in Christ. So he had such, that's why people were like, they didn't know what to do with John Paul II. Nobody knew what to do with him. Yeah. He was always one step ahead. Um, <laughs> always had something to say, but he was unashamed in calling out a culture that wasn't promoting religious freedom. And for him, that was very important. So whether you were a Jew or a Muslim, like there was something for John Paul II said, religious freedom is important. Um, as a man who grew up under, you know, the Nazis and then through communism under the Soviet Union, he knows what that's like. Uh, so I, I finished, I was reading that chapter last night and I was like, I gotta be like John Paul II. I gotta like be willing to enter into that. Um, but it's going to come from a place like, do I believe the church? Do I believe the church that Jesus himself instituted? Do I believe in Jesus? Because if I don't believe in Jesus, if I don't believe in what he said, if I don't believe in what he instituted, then I'm going to fall by the wayside. Yeah. That is what's going to happen. Yeah. So I think you as a focus missionary, you have a certain advantage in that you were trained to deal with that rejection and to persevere through it and going after people. There's a word for that. Uh, oh my goodness, I forgot. It was one Whereas of the Whereas yes, a diocesan priest is trained to keep a parish alive mm. and to keep a parish going. And that can often mean, and the image that they that they always give you as a diocesan priest is to be a good shepherd, you know, right? Pope Francis is always talking about smell like the sheep. Mm -hmm. You still have to be the shepherd who brings the sheep back. And that means that I think we, we can fall into the trap of thinking, I can never let a sheep wander. I have to prevent them from wandering at all. Instead of realizing sometimes we have to go out after the lost sheep yeah. to go and get them and bring them back. Um, that's where the missionary zeal part comes in. But sometimes we, we don't even want to have to get that far. I don't even want them to wander away. So that way I don't have to go out looking for them. If I just if I just give them what they want so they'll stay close by, then I never have to have that missionary zeal to go out and get them when they're lost. Hold on. But that's also like bad. Not I want to say bad parenting, but like I remember God the Father. Oh, and my relationship with him is like, he lets me wander. Yeah. And he's like, ah, I'm still pursuing you. Right. But I love you enough to let you wander. But this is where I think it's 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 a flaw in, in mm. for, I see it in myself. And I think a lot of diocesan priests would see this too. There's that temptation to say, if, if people walk away, then that means that I'm somehow failing mm. in my responsibility to this parish, mm -hmm. to this community. I, instead of, no, in fact, I am... I'm letting them see what is most important about the faith. Mm -hmm. I'm letting I'm I'm speaking to them about the truth of whether it's the truth of marriage and and what has to happen in order for a marriage to take place. Mm -hmm. uh, if if it's about how the liturgy needs to be celebrated so that we we treat the sacraments with reverence, with awe, with love. If it's letting people know that there are things that are sinful and that we can't do and we have to live differently. Um, it could just be about hey, this is 
this is the color that I chose for the wall that we're going to paint. And you might not like it, but it's my job to choose the color of the wall. You know, it could be something really simple like that. Or right now in, in, in with COVID insanity, right? We have to have this many spots available because we have to try to make sure that everybody feels safe when they come to mass. I'm sorry that you weren't able to get a spot. Yeah. Uh, it's not personal or anything like that, but people will say that it makes you a bad pastor. It makes you an unfair person or something like that. It's, it's not intentional. That's not the idea. But to, to have that missionary zeal that says, I'm, I'm willing to let you wander, but I'm not willing to forget about you. I'm not willing to just let you walk away and never go after you. Right. There's a temptation, I think, when, as a missionary, when, when that rejection comes in, if, if you're rejected to say, well, fine, then I'm not going to, I'm not going to do anything. But in, in fact, it's, it's the accept that they've walked away, accept that they don't want it. Mm -hmm. but never give up on, on pursuing them. Sometimes that pursuit has to happen on your knees. It has to happen in prayer. Yes. And yes. sometimes that pursuit has to happen by going out and trying to encounter them again. So yes. like when you're a missionary on a campus, student doesn't want to speak to you or isn't interested. Well, we talked again afterwards. Yeah, <laughs> it, took a, talk again. it took a couple months. <laughs> yeah. But you, you go back, you try to keep the connection yeah. going. Um, for, for a parish priest though, that doesn't always happen. It's not always, that's not always possible. So, but I realized it's like so often I'm not, bringing that to prayer. And then I got to thinking about the little sisters of the lamb, mm. you know, so my, my, my community that I, I am part of as a, as a sort of third order member of the family of, of the lamb. One of the resolutions that a priest of the lamb makes is to allow the wounds that we receive to allow the love of Christ to pour through our wounds. Go sell what you have. Come follow me. Come follow me. I'll make you fishers of men. You'll go out, you'll preach the gospel, you'll bring this, but you will also suffer as I have suffered. Let the love of Christ pour through your wounds, not for yourself, but for others. Mm -hmm. And that means letting the love of Christ pour through the wounds of being rejected because Jesus is rejected to identify yeah. more with him and then to try to become more like him yeah. and more perfect. And the more you try to become like him, then the more attractive the, the whole gospel presentation is. The more you're striving to be like Christ, the more people say, hey, there's something different about you. The more yeah. you stop looking like a bank manager and you look like the decisions you've made in your life have had some consequences <laughs> on your face. That's what it's all about. But this is it. Like The goal is to look like Jesus. That's why I have this beard. <laughs> <laughs> At least as long as you it's let me keep it slap. because we're going to get to uh, that, that fundraiser one of these days. Yikes, I'm nervous about that. I'm so anyway. grateful for it. Yes. Paolo, my friend, I think we need to, uh, okay. I think we need to wrap this up. Yeah. But, uh, this was, this was good. Thank you. Um, are, so, are you taking the lead next time? Do you have the topic for the next one? I do. Yes. Oh boy. I do. Okay. This is going to be fun. This is father Sam's topic. Woo. <laughs> yeah. But thank you. Cause the, uh, yeah, that, that missionary rejection thing has been, it's been on my heart a lot. And, um, you, you, you just get to a point where you're just like, you know what? That was awesome. You just, and, and it sounds so weird to say, but like start to build up, not this tough skin, but like this Holy spirit armor and you're like, okay, that's all right. I can go back out again. Cause it's not about me. It's about Jesus. Mm. And you know what, if this is making me more like Jesus, then I'm literally following the way of the cross. Amen. And that's, that's what this is about. All right. Well, this is uh, Roar Like the Lamb. I'm Paula Pena. Father Sam Cachuba. And uh, we'll see you guys next time. Sweet. Bye. <laughs>